we were recording. Yes. Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian and I use masculine pronouns. Welcome to any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here and welcome back any returning viewers. Thanks for following along with this thing that I do. This is a crafty type podcast coming to you from the Northwest Hills of Connecticut, which is an area um, that includes parts of the Tunxis, Pugusset, and Mohican homelands. I forgot the rest of this. Uh, this podcast episode has closed captioning and transcripts are available in the show notes. Show notes and everything can be found over at freakishlemon.com. Uh, we have a group on Ravelry. You can search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find us. And you can follow me at all the fun places like Instagram and Ravelry as Freakish Lemon. Because that's really what I use these days. Um, all the links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And uh, please remember to subscribe here on YouTube if you want to follow along with this thing that I do on YouTube and like know when I post videos and things. Uh, this is being filmed on Friday, December 20th, 2019, which is why we are in front of my tiny bedroom Christmas tree. Uh, and this is, I'm calling a zero effort podcast episode. No effort. So I am wearing a hat because the hair situation was a thing and why we're filming on the floor and why there's no lights on um the pff, what's the word i'm looking for the brightness on this camera is great because it's literally this tree and a lamp next to my bed that are on right now and uh, i don't know what it's going to look like by the time it makes it to the video but in my little preview screen here it looks pretty well lit um when it's really quite dark in here. Like, my dog is on my bed looking at me like I'm a crazy person trying not to fall asleep. And she's blinking her little eyes at me because she's trying not to fall asleep because it's that dark in here. Um, uh, yes, so the video that you just saw um, is me managing the uh, fabrics and materials that um, I suppose I've inherited from my grandmother. And I just didn't know how to talk about them on the podcast, because that just seems like, I don't know, it seems kind of shitty to be like, this is my haul for my grandma's basement, and frame it that way. Um, I think uh, me and Gabby from the Once Upon a Corgi podcast kind of ran into that <laughs> same conundrum. She's talked about it um, once or twice on her Vlogmas episodes now, but it was in the context of this is the thing that I'm doing right now. I'm bolting fabric that has been washed and, and retrieved from my grandmother's house um, type of situation. So, yeah. I just... It's also it kind of contributed a lot of what my time has been spent doing over the past couple of weeks because it was very time consuming to wash and organize all of the things that I did get. Um, I won't talk too much more about it because it's probably not that interesting. I just wanted to, um, in case you were wondering why I have so much white fabric now, um, I'm getting to a point in my sewing where I want to, I'm kind of semi-drafting a shirt pattern right now and I'm going to be doing some costume stuff, so I need fabric for mock-ups and there was fabric available for mock-ups. So I brought home as much of the white fabric that was in okay condition as I could, <laughs> as was reasonable for, I, I brought home a jumbo garbage bag of white fabric, as you saw. 
Um, so that's why I have so much white fabric. I'm not anticipating doing some giant project or I don't use a lot of white fabric normally in my sewing. I need mock-up fabric. Um, and otherwise this fabric is going to sit in a storage unit for probably another 20 years. <laughs> so it came home with me. Um, so let's move on to the podcast proper. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is dye stuff. I have not done any dyeing, but I did want to give you folks an update about my indigo dyed Targi yarn that I bought from Green Mountain Spinnery. This was the blue, of course it was blue, it was indigo dyed. This was the yarn that had a lot of lanolin in it, and it kept turning my hands blue whenever I picked it up. My hypothesis was that because there was so much lanolin in the yarn, it was the lanolin that was trapping the dye particles that were rubbing off on my hands. It wasn't necessarily what was in the yarn itself. So I have taken my five skeins, uh, and they look very different now, my five skeins of Targi wool, and I scoured them. I have a jug of um, kookaburra scour that I bought when I was processing my two mystery fleeces. Um, so I scoured the heck out of these. These went into hot, hot water with the scour three times at least. I think one of them only went two, but three times with the scour and then two more hot water rinses and the this is not going to be color correct because I don't have real lights on right now. Um, but before it was, I would say, a normal medium denim blue, and now it's more of a faded denim blue because so much of the dye particles were trapped by the lanolin. So that's a lesson for you if you are doing dyeing, especially indigo dyeing. I'm not sure how it would affect other dyeing, the amount of lanolin in the wool. Um, that's a question for somebody who's a lot more experienced in dyeing different types of wool than me. Um, but if you are doing something like indigo dyeing, where um, crocking or what's the word? There's another word for when it comes off on your hands um, is a thing, then definitely scour your wool if it is a, a natural, natural wool. If it's coming from a distributor like Wool to Die For or a commercial yarn, it's not gonna, ha you're not gonna have that problem. Um, but this was a, a very greasy wool that I got from Green Mountain Spinnery. Um, they do process a lot of really kind of off commercial breeds that are uh, have a lot more lanolin content in them than a, a merino or a BFL. So all five of these have been processed and that took me uh, almost two weeks just because of how time consuming it is. Um, and another reason why you want to scour your wool before you die is so you don't end up with this situation happening here. Apparently this section of this skein had almost no lanolin in it because the that was the color that my skeins were before and this is what they are after the lanolin has washed out. So this skein has a bit of a splotchy problem which I'm sure will not be a problem once I knit this up into a sweater because it's not gonna be it's not a straight dye anyway and I'll be alternating skeins and all that good stuff but it is something to be aware of um, if you are dying with greasy yarn. But that's all I have really to talk about uh, for dye stuff. I just wanted to give you guys an update. In case anyone else had the same question slash hypothesis that I did. My notes have fallen asleep. Surprise. It wouldn't be a podcast without my notes falling asleep. So I've got a couple of FOs to show you, but um, only one of them is something that you've seen before. So the first FO I have is a sewing finish object. I made these two pillow covers uh, while I was, hello, I knocked something down. I don't remember 
what prompted these pillow covers, but probably this fabric that I rediscovered in my stash, it's high penny, is orange. It has these stag heads on it. So I did this pillow cover and this is just a normal like sleeve pillow cover. This one has black piping on it. I made the piping. Um, the actual cord inside is a cord that I made out of some leftover worsted weight yarn of mine using a lucette tool um, and some bias binding of this black fabric, which is an Ikea sheet that didn't fit my mattress. Um, so that's that pillow. And then I have another smaller one. Uh, this one goes on my bed. This one goes on my chair at my high penny at my sewing desk. Uh, it's a smaller one. Um, same principle, but no piping because I didn't, I wasn't quite happy with how these curved corners turned out. Uh, so I just went with a regular square on this one. And then because although they look very nice from the front, this one had a bit of a snafu. I don't know if you can see it because it's black fabric and there's no lights on, but there's this little thing here. I put this snap in because I made the overlap a little bit too small and you could see the pillow underneath. Um, but while I was putting the snap in, I tore a huge hole in this fabric and I wasn't going to unpick it and cut a new piece. So I just like grabbed a scrap piece of fabric, put the other snap in it, and then just sewed it in place to where it should be. So it's a little bit hodgepodge, but it's fine because it's mostly under my butt in that chair. Um... So hooray. I think those were, honestly, it was just, it was supposed to be a weekend project that was like a quick, a quick hooray, but then it took me like a week to do. Everything's taking me 50 times longer than it should take me these days. That's just how it's going. And I keep not looking in the camera lens. That's a problem. Uh, another finished object is I finally finished these, <laughs> These palmer ribbed socks that you like can't see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Let's reflect some light from the other side of the room. Um, this yarn is Palmer Family Farms yarn and I think she hand spins it. There's this like rusty brick red and there's this natural brown. This is a ribbed sock pattern that I developed specifically for this yarn because I had a ton of it in stash and I wanted it all to be socks. So it's a, what is it? It's a two by two rib in the cuff. It's a three by one rib in the body and along the top of the foot. Um, it's fish lips kiss heel because I can use those uh, in a DK worsted weight type of weight. Um, for my foot size, I cast on 40 stitches using a size three needle, but most people have a tighter gauge than I do. I have a very loose gauge, so. If you've never knit worsted or DK weight socks before, look up a pattern for it. I, I've i knit a few pairs of socks in this weight of yarn that don't fit, so um, with the Palmer Family Farm yarns, it's all relatively the same weight. So this is uh, sock number five and six of my Palmer Family Farm socks in this particular um, pattern. And sock number six hit me hard. I didn't have second sock syndrome. I didn't have fourth sock syndrome. I had sixth sock syndrome. I, just that sixth sock took me so long to finish. And then I just have a couple of small other bits to show you. Um, I'm calling this a finished object. But it's a sample, is what it is. Uh, Morgan Donner came out with a video recently about a, a five-strand finger loop braiding technique. And I had never heard of finger loop braiding. And um, 
I was watching the video and at the time my hands were not in a position to be knitting or crocheting but I wanted to be doing something so I grabbed some cotton yarn off of a cone of cotton yarn that I have um, from webs and I did I don't know if it's gonna focus on this a five strand finger loop braiding sample Ooh, auto Oh, there we go. Yes. It creates... Ooh, it, it had it for a second. Nope, it's done. Uh, it creates a rounded cord that is similar to an I-cord in how it feels in the hand. But it doesn't have that... I mean, if you do I-cord well, you don't have that, like, weird seam side, but I don't do I-cord well. So it's... It's... kind of solid. I mean, it's not like... I'm describing this terribly. It has more volume to it than an I-cord, because there's something inside the tube. Um... But yes, according to Morgan Donner's video, uh, which I hopefully will remember to link, I know it's in the show notes, maybe I'll link it here if I remember, um, but it's often used for drawstrings, for if you need thick lacing. Um, she may have also said for garters on medieval hose and things, so... I wanted to try it out, and I think that my Salazar Slytherin will have need for something like this. So I've got a sample, and I can put that with what will eventually become a supreme amount of samples for that project. And then I finished some linen napkins. This is the linen that I indigo dyed. I cut them to same size rectangle. And I just did um, a narrow hem on them. I'm super pleased with how they turned out. And it's kind of just in the nick of time because I ripped a hole in the cotton napkins that I keep in my lunchbox um, on one of them. So I have three working cotton napkins. So works in progress. Before we get into what I have in this room, I have more works in progress downstairs. And since this is a zero effort podcast, I'm just going to take this camera and show you what's downstairs instead of trying to show you anything here. So here's the current state of the craft room. Christmas tree. And you can see we have some jeans that need mending, I have some fabric I need to wash, there's this jelly roll rug that I started with a rainbow jelly roll, but it's too fat to go through my sewing machine without breaking my sewing machine, because I tried it in both of them, so I'm doing it by hand, so that's very slow, plying the last of my brown cormo, and what else have we got? We've got unstarted project. I hope I would have hoped to have a mock-up done by now, but that's not going to happen. That will eventually be a vest for Gabby's wedding. Oh, I'm hitting everything with this tripod right now. This is my mom's Christmas present. And you can see how well that's going. Five days till Christmas. That's a rag wreath. That is half done. There's various other projects there in varying states of started. And uh, the Redford sweater has not moved since the last time I podcasted. That's still the front piece. And that's why you take the weights off 
your machine knitting if you walk away from it because that's been hanging there for a month now and um, everything's just a little bit crammed in here right now because of Christmas tree and you know what I don't know if I've ever shown them on the podcast before but uh, let's just zoom in on my favorite Christmas ornaments they're my favorite there they are Size Snoodles and the Max Rebo Band. Oh, they're so perfect. They're the best. Okay, so I have been doing some not craft room related projects. Uh, the main one of which is the return of the Cozy Memories Blanket. I am doing a Yarny Advent Calendar. Hi, Pam. She keeps looking at me when I talk. Um, it is an advent calendar that I made for myself last year before New Year's, so I don't remember what's in it. So I pulled out the blanket. And last time I talked about this blanket, I had decided that I was going to start doing double sized squares to finish off kind of one half of the blanket. The other day I counted how many small squares there are across. There are 23. So that idea is scrapped because I just do not have the brain motivation to put another row of small squares. And I'm not ripping these ones out. So it's small squares until the day I die. Um, so the squares that have progress keepers on them are ones that I have done. These are not all from the month of December. There were some from uh, the summer that I did, but, um, oh, this camera doesn't know where it's going. But I don't know which ones those were. There's that one and then I'm down here. So I think my plan is to go back to this old plan and kind of stair step it down and not add any vertically up this way until I get an idea of if the ratio is anywhere near correct. Yeah, I really should have counted those squares before I decided to do that double square idea. But I've been working on that. Um, I was doing English style knitting on this project. Uh, US1 Chiaogu uh, 2.25 millimeter needle. It's the memory blanket by Georgie Nicholson. Kept forgetting the pertinent information there. Um, what was I saying? Oh, I was knitting this English style but that has been hurting my wrists. So I went back to continental style for this blanket. I'm also much faster knitting continental style. And I can knit backwards. So when you get to six stitches, don't have to flip it over. Um, I've also been working on Gotta dig it out. My Rice Fields Shawl by Elsbieta Turink. This is on a US 3, 3.25 millimeter needles. Um, Barocco Ultra Alpaca Light for the black and Legacy Fiber Arts Hocus Pocus Colorways for the colors. This is a semicircular two-color brioche shawl. Last time you saw it, I was at... Oh, is the stitch marker even visible? This progress keeper. So I put four or five inches on it. Um, 
the end of this section is in sight. But the end of this shawl is not because I think I have three or four more sections and the stitches double every time a section ends. So a lot of stitches. It's And I do two pass two color brioche because I just do not currently have the brain power to put into the effort of learning one pass two color brioche. And that's the end of that. It's not going to fit back in that basket until I talk about these other whips. I've also been working on my pinwheel scrap squares. That's from the pinwheel scrap blanket pattern by Mina Phillip. I'm holding fingering weight yarn double using a th US 3 3.25 millimeter needle. The first one is done and the ends are mostly woven in. I got a couple of ends hanging out, maybe half the ends hanging out. So there's one, and I'm starting the second. This is not going to be a blanket. These are going to be seat covers for my car. Um, I haven't gone out to measure, but I've been thinking about the size of these and the size of the seat in my car, and I think at this point in my brain, I'm just gonna do, I don't know. I may just do four of these squares, seam them together, and that'll definitely cover the seats of my car. Um, so I might just do that instead of trying to figure out how many inches of border I need in order to make it work. I might just do four, seam them, slap it on the s car seats, and call it a day. So here's the second one. I'm in the third triangle. This one is using mostly the same yarns as this one. So if I do the four square idea, they'll kind of go diagonal to each other. And I'll have plenty of leftover minis now that I'm not doing double sized squares on my Cozy Memories blanket. And then I have a new cast on because I finished those socks. So I cast on another project that has been waiting for me. Uh, this is a project that has been waiting for a long time. I didn't have a pattern picked out for it, but I knew it was going to be either a shawl or a cowl out of a copious amount of very early on hand spun alpaca. So I opted to do the Nicoletta by Yuki HS. I'm doing this with US 8 five millimeter needles. And this is my cowl. I think it's a free pattern. Um, the cowl that's shown on the cover is a much more close fitting cowl. It's not a like right up to put on over your face cowl. It's more of a kind of this cowl, but I have so much alpaca and I already have a couple of cowls that sit in the same way that that pattern initially calls for, but the math to adjust it is really easy. Um, so I ended up casting on 200 stitches, I think it ended up being. Is it 200? No. Maybe. I'm not gonna count them to find out. Um, I cast on more stitches than what it calls for to get a length that's more of a twist it once and then put it over. So one loop. That was not a great explanation. So one cowl, twist it into two loops, put it on, and then it would be close fitting. zero effort. So this is where I am. Um, 
I was getting bored of doing the alternating cream colored yarns and the dark brown, so I switched it up to this um, sort of tawny brown. And I think once these sections are like the same height, I'm going to stop. I will not finish all of the alpaca hand spun I have, but I will have made a considerable dent and um, depending on how much is left, I'll either do a second project or I'll put it in the bin for weaving later. Um, because I don't use a ton of alpaca yarns these days. Alpaca was one of the first things that I learned how to spin on a drop spindle because it was prevalent at the small fiber events I was going to here in Connecticut um, and it was cheap. It was affordable for me at the time because I learned how to spin in college when I had zero income. Um, but it's not as versatile as wool. But yeah, that's the Nicoletta cowl. Um, it's a little bit slow going because my hands don't really like the needles in that size. Um, but I don't know if that's because I've been stressed and therefore inflammation is more prevalent in my life or if they just genuinely don't like that size. And then the other whip I have to talk about is the new crochet blanket. Um, because I finished one, so I've got to sew another one. Um, this is out of these big Noro cakes that I got, um, from a local yarn store on our fall yarn crawl. That's the word I'm looking for. And I was planning on doing a granny square, a granny log cabin, uh, blanket, but I started it and you couldn't tell where the log cabin sides were, uh, just because of the nature of this Noro yarn. So I ripped out the kind of log cabin square sides and just continued out the granny square um, that was written in the pattern that I had looked up. And it's slightly different from the granny square that I learned from my mom, but it looks like it's not gonna have the issue that we always have where our corners end up really long, the bigger the blanket gets. Um, so this is what I've done. It's kind of a placemat size. I'm using a US, I 5.5 millimeter hook. It's this wooden hook that I got at Michael's, I think, when they were clearancing out these rosewood hooks. So it's just a granny square around and around until the end of time, which is kind of exactly what I need crochet for in my brain. Um, and that's what I've been working on. So other stuff, uh, stuff that I am watching. I've got two Star Wars things to talk about because Star Wars is happening. So first thing I, I mean, these are gonna be brief, zero effort. Uh, the Mandalorian, uh, which is the new TV show. I, I'm liking it. Oh. Oh, is somebody here? What? Don't, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump. I will get you down. That dog. Nope. Yeah, my dad just pulled in the driveway and um, that bed is too high for her to jump off of. She will hurt herself. <laughs> but that doesn't stop her from doing it. So The Mandalorian, um, that's the new TV show and I've been enjoying it. It's been getting better, but honestly, it is just fluff TV um, for me. Um, watching the 
um, concept art slideshows during the credits is the same level of entertainment that I feel while watching the TV show. I don't know... I love the side characters. Mando's alright. Um, Baby Yoda is great. But I'm not, like, sucked in waiting for the next episode to show up. <laughs> I'm not furiously re-watching it for clues as to what's going to happen the way I was with Rebels or Clone Wars. Not really Clone Wars. <laughs> I'm, I'm not searching it for every little nugget of Star Wars information I can possibly glean. Um, which is how I typically react. <laughs> to things that I love about Star Wars, so it's just been kind of meh for me. I mean, it's it's a way to spend 40 minutes that I don't hate. Okay, and then today, Friday the 20th, I went to go see The Rise of Skywalker, number nine. Um, and I'm not going to give any spoilers. I'm really not going to say anything about the movie itself. I'm just going to say that I personally enjoyed it a heck of a lot. Um, in the same way that I enjoy extended universe books and TV shows and video games and... the drama of the Force, I found it incredibly delightful. There's a particular type of Star Wars drama that I adore, and this movie fell into that groove in my brain. So if you didn't like it, you maybe have not found that groove in your brain. <laughs> um, what am I listening to? So I've been not listening to audio podcasts because zero effort uh, for the past three months. <laughs> so it's mostly been audiobooks. I talked about the Raven Cycle series in my last episode. I've been re-listening that to that and uh, sort of as I was finishing my second re-listen, uh, Call Down the Hawk by Maggie Steve Fodder. Uh, narrated by Will Patton, came out. Uh, it's part of a sequel trilogy to The Raven Cycle, um, the Dreamer trilogy, and I really enjoyed it. And then I listened to A Court of Mist and Fury um, by Sarah J. Moss, uh, narrated by Jennifer Ikeda. I definitely liked this book more than the first one, but there are some pretty jarring pet peeves that I have about Sarah J. Moss's writing and how she's crafted this world that throw me out of the story so I this is not the one for me I'm not gonna go searching for the third book to listen to I just think it's not one that I'm currently in the headspace to even care about uh, I've and and because of those pet peeves that I have I turned to my my fey favorite, Holly Black, and I listened to The Cruel Prince, uh, which is narrated by Caitlin Kelly, and I started The Wicked King, which is also narrated by Caitlin Kelly. Um, I haven't finished it yet because I've been stressed, so I just need comfort listening. So I'm re-listening to The Raven Cycle. <laughs> It'll be Star Wars books after this because... I need some Star Wars books in my brain for a while. Um, I also borrowed from the library digitally um, The Children of Blood and Bone by um, by Tomi Adeyemi, uh, narrated by uh, Bonnie Turpin. I said that weird. Bonnie with an A, not with an O. I don't know if that's coming across. Um, that's incredibly good. That is a really good series. If you like fantasy in any way, you ought to, um, I said series. 
I've got the second one on hold for the library because I need to listen to the second one. It was really, really good. And because fantasy series tend to create bubbles where you kind of don't go outside the norms, like, you know, elves and dwarves are usually pretty the same throughout type of thing. Um, this series really took magic in an interesting and new to me place. So thumbs up for that series. Uh, stuff that I'm reading, I actually started a physical book that I can kind of talk about. I started um, Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters and I just need to tell you how refreshing it is to start a book about gay people where the main character immediately knows that she's gay and doesn't have an existential crisis over it. Like, I'm not even that far in. I'm maybe an eighth of the way in through this book. And I'm like, oh my god. We're not going to spend this entire book pining, should I go for it, should I not, blah, blah, blah. Like, that has been so rare in my experience that I, I, I don't think I've ever read a book with a queer character as the main character where that was not the case. Like, wow. <laughs> Um, and that's really all I've got to talk about for this episode. Um, so show notes and links to everything will be over at FreakishLemon.com. Uh, you can join us in the groups tab. Just search Freakish Lemon. You can follow me, as Freakish Lemon, on Instagram and Ravelry. Links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And um, if you want to follow along and know when my next video goes up, consider hitting that subscribe button if you want. No pressure. I'm going to go eat dinner. And uh, that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>